So first, I need to say something about the title of the talk. I have it up here as Managing Your Prejudices. So that's the first thing I want to talk about is even the word prejudice. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's kind of a creepy word. <laughs> so, and when people ask me to kind of make it a little uh, nicer, um, I'll change it to biases. Um, but prejudice is, a, is an uncomfortable word uh, because, well, for lots of reasons. For those of us that have been the object of prejudice, we know that it's painful and damaging and it's angering. It's a, it's a terrible experience. And for those of us that have feelings of prejudice against others, we might be a little ashamed of it and wish that it weren't true, or we might even deny it. So the word prejudice is uncomfortable for lots of reasons. It's something we don't want to admit that we have. And we certainly don't want to be the object of it. So in the next couple of hours, I'm going to be talking to you about several things that are going to make you uncomfortable. And I apologize for that. I hope that after, after the couple of hours are up, you'll be a little bit more comfortable talking about the topic, and it won't, be, it won't sting so much. OK? Um, OK, so the first thing I want to say about prejudices is that we all have them. Every single person in this room has prejudices. And if you don't, you're not human. So we might have prejudices against all, certain, all sorts of things. It might be related to race, ethnicity, the way that people dress, the way that they speak. It might be related to your feeling about poor people, or people who lost their teeth, or people that wear high heels, or all sorts of things. It's that feeling of, oh, I don't really feel comfortable with that person just because of the way they look, or the way they speak, or something. Pre prejudice is about prejudging. It's, it's about having a gut feeling about somebody when, you've, when you don't know anything about them. So I'll tell you mine. And again, I'm a little ashamed of it. I am very uncomfortable with people that have multiple body piercing and lots of tattoos. And um, I saw somebody this morning that had uh, uh, bright pink hair. And I, I couldn't help but leering. I, I had to, uh, I, I did not manage my prejudices. I, I leered. <laughs> And um, I, I'm uncomfortable with, with people that look like that. And, and even, even though even I'm, I try to remind myself, this might, might be the most intelligent, most kind, most lovely person in the entire world, but my gut feeling is very uncomfortable. Now, um, well, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So I'm going to prove to you that you have prejudices too. So I want you to look. At the, uh, at the photos that I'm going to show you, and I want you to silently answer the questions. Is the person honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? OK, so you don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell each other, but you do have to tell yourself. Is this person honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? What about this fellow? Is he honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? This girl? This young woman, honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? This guy, honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? What about him? Is he honest, lazy, hardworking, or a liar? OK, so did you notice? Did you have a gut feeling? Did anybody not have a gut feeling about these people? You didn't? <laughs> um, well, for those of you that did, do you notice that you have an automatic feeling about people? And what do we know about these people? Do we know where they went to school? What kind, of, what kind of jobs they have? Do we know if they're good to their children or whether they beat their children? We don't know anything about them. And yet, for most of us, we're going to have an impression about them just by how they look. So I want to say to you that there is no such thing as a first impression. There's no such thing as a first impression. Not for adults. The last time you had a first impression, you were very small. Now, when you have a gut reaction to somebody, it has to do with something that happened in the past. You saw somebody that looks like them. You had an experience with somebody that reminds you of them. Your grandmother told you that people like that are x, y, or z. You read about them. You saw them on television. When you have a gut feeling towards somebody that's in front of you, 
as adults, it is not a first impression. You are basically looking at somebody and they were reminding you of somebody else that you've met in the past or you've been told about in the past or you saw on tele television or something like that. I bet we all have stories about people that look like this. We've seen them on TV. Our grandmother told us about them. We saw them in the news. We had an experience with them. Maybe it was a really good experience. Maybe it was a really bad experience. So I'll give you another example for, for me. My, uh, my grandmother was a big, busted, kind of rotund lady from Russia. Right? My, my lovely Jewish grandmother that always thought everybody else was too skinny and she had to feed us, us all. Right? <laughs> and she sp spoke with a, a thick Russian Jewish accent. And for me, I don't know, when I hear somebody speak with that accent, I love them. <laughs> yeah. I, I, assume, I assume right away that they're caring. I assume they make good chicken soup. Um, I, I, you know, I assume all kinds of things about them just the moment they open their mouths. Because for me, they're my grandma. So where do prejudices come from? Just as I said, someone told you about these people. You saw them in movies, TV, books. You had a memorable interaction or relationship with someone that looks like that. And you generalize to think all people who look like that are something, something. Like for me, everyone that has a Russian Jewish accent is a, a sweet, loving person. So, well, I'll tell you the good news. First, I'll tell you the bad news. I used to think that no matter, no matter what I did, I would still be creeped out by people that have multiple piece piercing and tattoos and things like that. I used to think that if I went to a psychiatrist for 10 years to work it out, Maybe, maybe um, I might feel a little better about it. But um, I'm starting to experiment with something, and I'm starting to read some research that says that the more exposure you have to the group, the more you get to know individuals, the weaker is the prejudice. You can imagine I gave a talk like this. And afterward, this young man came over to me and stuck out his tongue to show me the piercing in his tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Then he opened his shirt <laughs> to show me the tattoos. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, boy, you really, I said, I'm really sorry. I'm really trying to work on this. <laughs> and, um, you know, I will say that as we chatted and the more he told me about why he had gotten the different tattoos and what they meant to him, he told me why he had gotten these body piercings and how they, what that made him feel like and why it was important to him. And the more I got to see him as an individual and as a human being, I will tell you, I felt a little better about it. You know, I did. I actually, in my heart, I felt a little better about it. This was a, a study that was done I thought was really great. So quick, how many people are there? How many people think there are three? Don't be shy. How many people think there are three? Very good. How many people think there are four? <laughs> How many people think there are five? How many people think there are six? OK. All right, so here's the truth about it. Um, when I first looked at it, the very first time I looked at it, I thought, oh, there are three people here. Now. I have looked at it a hundred times, and I cannot see, I can't, I can't understand why I didn't see six initially, because I've stared at it so many times. So there are six separate individuals. So first of all, um, this is, these pictures have been photoshopped to make it tricky for you. All the necks are the same. They made the hair the same. But if you look at the structure of the eyes, for example, so look at the fellow on top. Look how the one on, the, on your left has got rounder eyes. Then the fellow on the right, look how the structure of his eyes are really completely different. They're probably not even related to each other. This fellow over here, similarly, the one on the left, his eyes are much rounder than the guy on the right. This one, the nostrils are different here. The mouth is different. Um, then the fellow on the, uh, at the bottom, look at, this, look at the nose, how this nose is much more turned up than the, uh, that nose. He did not have a nose job. Um, it is, these are six separate individuals. Six separate individuals. 
So um, what's interesting about this particular uh, photograph is that there was a study done where they trained people to look and to identify the unique characteristics of individuals in different races. First, they tested, their, their, they tested people's um, level of prejudice or racial bias. bias, And there are some really good uh, tests for that, that even test for unconscious racial bias. Then they taught people to distinguish the unique facial characteristics of individuals, and then they tested them again. And what they found out is that when you begin to really see the unique, distinct characteristics of different people and see them as individuals, the feeling of racial bias or racial, racial prejudice is actually diminished. Now, I found that to be very heartening, very, very heartening, because basically, Prejudice requires you to have a feeling that those people are all the same. That if they look like some undifferentiated mob of people, it's easier to feel prejudiced against them or to feel uncomfortable with them as a group. When you start to see unique characteristics, then, then the prejudice gets weaker. It gets weaker as you begin to see people as individuals, as unique individuals. Wasn't that cool? People with disabilities are often the object of prejudice. For one, we may think of them as being weak or sad, less competent. There are a lot of like um, kind of gut reactions that somebody may have towards somebody that has different abilities. So part of it is even managing your own prejudices. Seeing somebody that's sitting in a wheelchair and say, oh, that's my prejudice, saying that this person's not competent, or they're not smart, or they can't do the job, or they're depressed, or whatever it is that you're projecting onto that person. Oh, yes, that's my prejudice talking to me. But that may not have anything to do with the individual sitting there. I actually, if you don't mind, um, want to talk about different aspects of our cultural selves. Now, we walk in here, and, and everybody has some sense of racial identity. Right? Some of us will call ourselves white. Some of us will call ourselves black. Some prefer African American. Some pre pre prefer Caucasian. Some will call themselves multiracial. Some will call ourselves Asian. Some will call ourselves Middle Eastern. Some will call ourselves, I don't know what, I don't, can't remember what I've left out, um, Native American. Um, so we'll all have a, a racial identity. Most of us will have a religious identity. Um, and then we have other, other characteristics about ourselves that, that we hold dear to ourselves. So it might be, for example, you might consider yourself a teacher, or you might consider yourself an athlete, or you might consider yourself a mother. So this is something that I kind of, the way that I defined myself. I put myself in the middle, Gail. And, then, and when I think about the identities that I feel strongly identify me as a person, I have liberal Jewish a mother, I, I'm an international traveler, and that's kind of a part of who I'm proud of, who I consider myself to be, and I'm a public health consultant. Those are just four things that I said off the top of my head. So we all have some way of identifying ourselves. Then there are stereotypes, and I'm actually going to give you an exercise in a minute. So I want you to choose two stereotypes that are related to one of these things. So actually, the way I did this was one stereotype that's true is that um, women cry a lot. That's a, isn't that a stereotype, more compared to men? So I'm female, and I would say that that, I, I, that fits me. I do cry a lot, or at least I cry more than most men that I know. And <laughs> um, another stereotype is, uh, is that Jews are good accountants. So here's, I'm Jewish, and I am not a good accountant. In fact, I have never, I am 54 years old, I have never balanced my checkbook, not <laughs> once. So um, that's a stereotype that is not, not true of me. So what I want you to do is to get into groups of four people. On a piece of paper, write your name and four aspects of your identity. This might include your race, ethnicity, profession, a hobby, or anything else that you consider important about you. Then, based on the four aspects of your identity, write one stereotype that is true about you and then one stereotype that is not true about you. 
and then share what you have written about your identity in the two stereotypes. Next, I want you to share with one another the stereotype that stings, the one that really hurts. So for example, for some ethnic groups, there's a stereotype about being lazy. For other ethnic groups, there might be a stereotype about being dishonest. For another ethnic group, there might be a stereotype about being uh, an abuser of alcohol or drugs. So I want you to share a stereotype about one of the groups that you identify with the stereotype that stings. It's amazing, talking about prejudice can be fun. <laughs> talking about stereotypes can be fun, right? Now, why are we laughing? Notice, I looked around the room, I love this exercise because people start off and everybody looks so uncomfortable. Ooh, is, am I gonna actually talk about this? And then people are all laughing. Many people are laughing. Why, do you, why are you laughing? It is absolutely a relief. It's like cathartic when you're, when you're uncomfortable talking about something and all of a sudden it's OK. It's, it's, a, it's cathartic, right? It's a relief to be able to talk about stuff like this. So stereotypes are true of some individuals, but not true of others, right? Some Asians are good at math, I think, right? <laughs> um, individuals differ based on how they were raised, their personal life experiences, their education, their socioeconomic status, whether they have traveled, and the personality that they were born with. So within any group that you can identify, you can find some stereotypes that are true of that individual and some stereotypes that are not true at all of the individuals. I said, I'm not a good accountant. I will tell you that there are some Jews that are really good accountants. So let's talk about managing your prejudices. The first thing to do is to fess up. That means confess, confess to yourself. I am a person that has prejudices. And then think about where your prejudices came from. You know, well, uh, my first experience with someone that looked like that was my grandmother or some kid that beat me up at the school ground. Where did your prejudice come from? And examine the statement, those people are all the same. And remind yourself that it's not true. And learn about the individuals that you meet. Everything you think or say about a cultural group is true of some people in that cultural group and not true of other people in that group. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about, equally fun, are um, microaggressions. <laughs> microaggressions are things like, boy, you're really smart for somebody of your race. Some of my best friends are blah, 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 right? OK, so a microaggression is a subtle and often unintentional offense. Comments like, you're very smart for somebody of your race. Some of my best friends are. Or other things, nonverbal things, like being ignored in a group setting. Being watched carefully in a store to make sure you're not stealing. OK, so let's talk about what they're really like. So um, <laughs> funny, right? All right, people of your race or ethnicity dance so well. I wish I could dance like you people do. What's wrong with that statement? OK, for one, it's social exclusion. It's a generalization and a stereotype. It's also social exclusion. You're different from us. Your group are different. You're the people that dance well. I'm different. It's a narrow focus. The victim may think you are ignoring other characteristics of the group, like their intelligence or good moral character. Some of my best friends are blah, blah, blah. What's wrong with that statement? It's also social exclusion. It's the implication that it is unique or newsworthy. 
for someone like you to be a friend of someone like me. So it's like, when, it's like bragging. Oh, yeah, I have friends that are X, Y, or Z. It's like uh, I'm such a great person that I would consider you know, lowering myself to have a friend like somebody like that. It's actually like news. Like, oh, it's like a, a thing that's so unusual and so special about me that I have to announce it. It's demeaning to the other person, and it's demeaning to the group. You're very intelligent for someone of your group. It's clear. You know, and I actually have had, I know, I know that statement happens. I've had several people come over to me after classes and say, you know what, somebody actually really said that to me. They really did come over and say, oh, you're so smart for somebody that's like your group. It diminishes the group, obviously. It's insulting. It implies that the group is inferior. Uh, anyone who really tries to, can get ahead in this country. What's wrong with that statement? Yeah, it implies you're not trying hard enough, or they're not trying hard enough. It's a denial of isms. It implies that people at the lower end of society aren't working hard enough. I understand, as a woman, I face discrimination too. What's wrong with that statement? It's implying that every form of discrimination is essentially the same, and they're not. Discrimination stinks. That's the only thing that makes different forms of discrimination the same. Different forms of discrimination are different. And because you've been discriminated against for some reason, it doesn't mean that you are the same or that you understand the discrimination of everybody else that's been discriminated against. They're different. It's another form of denial. It's assuming that different forms of prejudice are comparable, and they're not. They all stink. They're all painful, but they're all different. OK, this was a real case. She was, um, Kathy was a bright and articulate pharmacy student. Um, she was a woman of color. After counseling a patient about her medication, the patient said warmly, you are very intelligent for someone of your race. What should Kathy say? So I want to talk about just responding to microaggressions. So in the first case, when you feel like somebody is discriminating against you or is, being, is tr treating you in a bad way because of your race, ethnicity, your body type, your religion, your something, 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 the first thing that you need to assess is, are you in danger? You want to protect your safety. Run away. <laughs> then assess the intent. Did the person intend to be harmful or insulting? Because if the person intended to be harmful or insulting, you're going to treat that person very differently than someone who's just clueless. If you determine that the person is simply clueless, then, then you want to determine whether it's worth confronting. And it's worth confronting if you care about the relationship. If the person's educable, is this somebody that I can actually educate? Am I ever going to see this person again, or is this just like a one-time thing, and I don't care what they think? So you want to de decide whether it's worth confronting. Is this a reasonable person? Is this a relationship you care about? Will you feel better? Wait until you're calmed down. Right? I mean, generally in life, if somebody said something that's upsetting to you, it's a good idea to wait until you're calmed down. Speak one-on-one. -on -one. Like, better um, to get the person aside and say, listen, I, I want to talk to you about something, rather than in a, a, a group, because the dynamics will be different. The person will be defensive. They'll be embarrassed. It's more likely to lead to some kind of altercation. Don't accuse them of racism or prejudice. If you call somebody a racist, how, or you tell them, if you say that they're prejudiced, how are they going to react? They're going to become defensive. They're going to deny it. They'll probably be denying it to themselves. You will not educate them at all. You'll, you'll basically close off any kind of communication. They will not listen to what you have to say. 
So inform them that the comment or the action was hurtful and why. When you said to me that I'm intelligent for someone of my race, I felt very hurt. I felt upset. And the reason I felt upset is because that comment makes me feel bad because it implies that people of my race are generally not intelligent. Then you want to provide missing information. These, this is a clueless person that is, is ill-informed. Actually, most people of my race are quite intelligent and hardworking, just like people of your race. The news only reports on people in trouble and distorts the truth about most of us. So, I mean, I just picked those words, but the point here is to educate them, is to give them some piece of information that they do not have. Don't expect them to understand or apologize. Act gracefully, act with some dignity, and if they, under, if they don't understand or they don't apologize, there's nothing you can do about it. This is an important tip to remember. Not everyone has walked in your shoes or been through your experiences. So not everyone will understand or even validate how you are feeling. If you decide to confront someone, do it with the aim of simply trying to let him or her know how you feel. Bob, the director of the billing department in the hospital, has been interviewing candidates for an accounting position. He offers the job to Joseph, a man in his 30s, who appears to have the qualifications for the job. He is an MBA from an excellent school, five years experience, and good interpersonal skills. Joseph appears pleased, but says he needs to discuss the offer with his partner. Bob is confused and says, oh, I didn't know you were in business with someone else. Joseph replied, I met my partner in my personal life. I'm gay. Bob is surprised and embarrassed and says, oh, I worked with a gay guy once. I don't have any problem with gays. They're just like normal people, right? <laughs> Joseph smiled politely as he left. One hour later, Bob received an email from Joseph declining the offer. Why did he decline? Kind of clear, right? Is this an example of a, mi a microaggression? Right? Bob did not mean to be offensive, but the comment of, I don't have any problem with gays, they're just like normal people, right? Is an example of a microaggression. <laughs> So let's think about how to respond to Bob's comment. So first, assess Bob's intent. Was he, did he intend to be heart hurtful? No, I don't think so. I think he falls in the clueless category. Determine whether it's worth confronting. And Joseph can think about this. So if Joseph wants the job, then it probably is worth confronting because he's going to have a relationship with Bob and he wants it to be a good relationship and he wants Joseph, he wants Bob to know how he felt. So he's going to inform Bob that the comment or the action was hurtful and why. Provide, and then he'll provide missing information. Don't expect him to understand or apologize. It's, it's a bonus if you get some understanding and apology, but you may not. So OK, so first thing, inform them that their comment was hurtful and why. I know, I know you don't mean to be offensive, but that comment is hurtful. It implies that gay people are not normal. Right? Joseph could have said that. Provide missing information. Actually, most gay people live lives just like yours. We get up and eat breakfast in the morning, go to work, and watch TV. The difference between you and me is that my partner is someone of the same gender as me. Does that seem like a reasonable response? And Bob, if he were a decent human being, would have said, oh, thank you for clarifying that. Or thank you for pointing out that I said something that was hurtful for, to you. I didn't mean it. Right? So can I make you uh, get into groups again? You can get into the same groups, or you might want to get into different groups, however you want to do it. And the assignment is, everyone, I want you to um, share one incident in which you were the victim of a microaggression 
whether or one that you, you were witness to someone else that was the victim of a microaggression, or you were the perpetrator. Okay? And so I want you to basically just share what was that microaggression, what happened, and what would have been a reasonable response. What should you do if you observe someone unintentionally saying something hurtful to someone else? First, you want to keep your eye on the goal. And the goal here is not to escalate bad feelings in the room. The goal is to educate and change the point of view or the behavior of the perpetrator. If at that moment you say, well, that was kind of a jerky comment, you, you're, you're not serving that goal. So my opinion is that you have a separate, quiet conversation with the person, the perpetrator. You know, I noticed when you made that comment the other day towards that person that that might have been a comment that was hurtful, and I think you're right about not using the word offensive, that could have been hurtful towards that person. That's my opinion. And you could have also said to the, the victim of the comment privately, quietly, I just want to tell you I was uncomfortable about the comment that was made. Was that hurtful for you? Does that seem reasonable? See, the thing about this is that it's already charged. And I think you're right. It's charged. The word prejudice is charged. The whole conversation is charged. People are uncomfortable about this kind of thing. What if you determine that the person intentionally was hurtful or intentionally insulting? If somebody is intentionally trying to hurt you or insult you, for goodness sake, the first thing to do is make sure that they're not threatening you in some serious way. You know, make sure that you're not in danger. And then, then the only thing I can say is that if somebody is so bad that they're intentionally saying something that is hurtful or insulting, there is nothing that you are going to say that, that's going to make the person say, oh, now I get it. Oh, I changed my mind, and I'm not prejudiced anymore, and I'm, now I'm going to be nice to you. That is not going to happen. And so my guess is that there's not a lot that you can do that's going to change that human being. The question is, is that is there some wider social justice system? Can you then go appeal to somebody in HR? Can you? Find out, find out, or can you basically have the person sued for discrimination? Is there some wider system, system intervention that could basically take the power away from that particular individual? I think power structures are, in some ways, everything. You know, I mean, um, you know, the problem with ra with racism and prejudice and uh, bias is that uh, well, there are two things. One, it hurts people's feelings and it's insulting and damaging to people psychically. But then there's the whole other world of it being damaging to people in other more tangible ways, like not getting a job that you should get, or not getting the salary that you deserve. Um, you know, those are, or not being able to live in a place where you want to live. You know, there are other kind of physical, tangible results of discrimination that are beyond, um, you know, that are beyond the simple, uh, you know, my feelings are hurt and I feel like somebody's damaged me psychically. Which is worse, the person that's prejudiced in your face uh, and says something insulting, or the person that's prejudiced behind your back and uh, keeps you from getting the job? But I will say that if we're trying to change the behavior of the people that are prejudiced behind your back and keep you from getting the job, one of the things that, that we want them to have a sense of is some sense of what the social norms are. That if you want to be kind of respected in society, it means that you treat people fairly. That we need to establish that as more of a, a social norm. That if you, 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 if we want, if you want to be treated respectfully in society, I expect you to treat people fairly with regards to all of these things that we're talking about. That sometimes the person that made a comment and they had no bad intention at all. They were just asking a question and that the victim or the supposed victim of the microaggression is actually oversensitive 
or assuming that the person meant something bad when they didn't. And, you know, listen, that happens all the time to all of us. Accents in foreign languages. Um, certainly another reason why someone might be a victim or an object of prejudice is because of the way they speak, right? Now, I am I'm completely on the opposite end of this. I'm very weird. I, I, I think it's because of my grandma that spoke so, her accent was so strong that other people could not understand what she said, that when I hear somebody speak an accent, I love them. And I, lo I, I think it, it's why I it really, <laughs> It's why I've spent a lot of time with, with um, foreigners, as I call, as I call them. Um, I, I, I think accents, there's something charming for me about it, and there's something intriguing. I just love accents. But not everybody feels that way. You know, some people hear an accent and they think something bad. They feel uncomfortable around it. They feel that that person's foreign. They feel that that person's not intelligent. Sometimes people that have accents or, or, or not fluent or hard to understand. Right? Doesn't happen? So this is what you should say. Teach your employees to say, I realize that I have an accent. If you don't understand me, please tell me and I'll say it again using different words. Teach your employees to say, forgive me. I'm having trouble understanding your accent. Can you say it again with different words or write it down for me? Something along those lines, because what I'm trying to say is that it is sometimes problematic to understand somebody that has a strong accent, right? So there's a way to bring it out in the open and say, listen, you know, for supervisors to stay their employees that have accents, you have an accent. You're also a valued employee here. We want you to stay here. We want you to be here. And we want people to know what you say because what you say is important. So here's my recommendation. Tell people, I know I have an accent. It may be hard for you to understand me sometimes. If you cannot understand me, please tell me and I will repeat it or I will say it again with different words. It's a practical solution. So um, this is what I want to say to you about the people that speak foreign languages around you. Um, especially at work, they're not talking about you. <laughs> they're not talking about you. They're talking about what they're going to have for lunch or what they did yesterday. They're talking about how their kid's doing in school. They're not talking about you. So, and I know that it's natural. It's natural when people are near you and they're speaking in a foreign language, you think they're talking about you, but they're not. So um, this will be my last little group, little exercises. Actually, I want you to get into groups of two. Okay, here's your assignment. I want you to talk about what are you doing today and what are you going to do tomorrow? Except I want you to change really three words. Instead of am is now red, are is blue, go is green, and like going is greening. So what red you doing today? You get it? Oh no, did I get it right? Oh. See, even I can't do it. Okay, what red you greening to do tomorrow? Oh, what, what, oh, darn it. You get the, you get the problem here? Okay, so I'm going to give you five minutes in pairs. I want you to answer these questions using these, this new language. This is a new language that you're all learning, okay? You only have to learn, really, it's really only three words. You could do it. Did I make my point? Did I make my point? So when you look at somebody that comes to the United States and they're learning English, and you say, why don't those people just learn English? Why don't they just learn English? Can you see how difficult it is to learn another language and how unnatural it feels having a conversation in a foreign language? It feels unnatural. And it is not easy. So when you're with somebody that speaks your language, what do you want to do? You want to speak your language. 
It's very awkward. It's difficult to learn another language, right? And this was three words. Did anybody find it hard? It's very hard. It is hard to learn another language. It's very hard. And when people ask me the question, why don't those people learn English? Why are they not learning English? The answer that I tell them is they are learning English. They are. Today's immigrants are learning English about as well as yesterday's immigrants did. So throughout history, when immigrants came to the United States, you think they all arrived and within a few months they spoke English? They did not. It takes years to get really fluent at a, at a language. And of course, depending on how old you are when you came. And when you meet somebody that speaks very little English, what you can assume about them is that they came as an adult. You can assume that they may not have been here very long or they don't have a lot of opportunities to learn English. The other thing that you can assume about an immigrant that does not speak English very well is that they're upset about it. They're unhappy about it. And when somebody doesn't speak English well, or if they don't speak English at all, it's almost never because they don't want to. Almost always they really, really want to, and it is hard. It is hard to learn another language. Some of, it, of us are better than others, but in general it's hard to, to learn another language. So have compassion for these people that come and they're trying to they're trying to learn English, they're struggling along with it, and have compassion for people, the janitors, that are just having a normal conversation in Spanish or, he, or Creole or whatever. They just want to have an informal conversation about what they're going to have for lunch or what they're doing tomorrow or what they're doing this weekend. And for them to struggle in trying to have that conversation in English makes them feel like they're saying, I read whatever, right? That's what they feel like when they're trying to do it in English, and it's not fun for them. They just want to, just for a moment, can I just have a conversation with my friend in my language and not struggle with it? Okay? One thing that's simply polite is to ask the foreign language speakers to say, um, I apologize that we're having this language, this conversation with ourselves right now. We're just discussing lunch tomorrow. You know, or just something to say, or I'm just talking about what I'm, uh, I'm going to do this weekend, just so that they know that you're not, um, you're, they're not deliberately trying to exclude you. If you can't understand somebody's conversation, then by definition you're being excluded. I mean, we all have to have compassion for one another. So, you know, I'm asking the English-only speakers to have compassion for the foreign language speakers. It is also appropriate to ask the foreign language speakers to have compassion for the English-only speakers. To say to your employees, we know you're not really talking about us, but it makes us feel excluded when you're having your conversation in your language. I wanted to just say something about naming racial and ethnic groups. People have strong feelings about this. And so a good thing to do is to ask people how they name their, gr their group or how they want to be referred to. So here are lots of, lots of, lots of names, African-American, black, and then some people actually want to be referred to by the specific country they're from. They're Haitian or they're Jamaican. You know, I know some Jamaicans that don't feel African-American. They're Jamaican. Don't think that newly arrived Africans from Nigeria feel like they're part of the Haitian community or the African-American community. These are people that have had very different life experiences. They come from entirely different societies, different parts of the world, very different cultures. Don't lump them together. Don't assume that, uh, that, that Haitians and African-Americans get along or that they feel like they're the same group of people. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, the Hispanics, Latinos, some, some Hispanics prefer Hispanic, some prefer Latino. Um, the Cube, some people want to be referred to by the country they come from, Cuban or Colombia or Mexican, et cetera, Asian, um, or they want to be referred to by the specific country they come from, the Chinese, the Filipinos, the, the Vietnamese, um, the American Indians, Native Americans. I hate the word Caucasian. I don't know why. For one, I, the Caucasus is a particular part of Europe that I don't come from. <laughs> so um, I'm usually uncomfortable about that. I actually like European American. I, I'm not Anglo. I am not British. And so for me, I kind of feel like I'm not Anglo. I'm, do I look British? I'm not British. So um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I always feel uncomfortable about that. But so there are whole, all these words that people use. You might just ask people, how do you refer to your group? Or how do you 
want, want to be called. And the last slide that I have is something about, um, is, to, is to realize that um, there are a lot of wars in the world and a lot of, a lot of ethnic conflicts. So don't assume that, um, that Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laotians, Hmong, that all those people get along. They, uh, they have very difficult histories with one another. There's been a lot, of, a lot of history of conflict. So don't lump that group of people together. They don't want to be lumped together. And be aware of the fact that, um, that when people come from pl places in the world that have been in conflict, they, have, they bring that with them. And that it may be a challenge for them to work with people that come from the other side. I'd like to end the class with some final words about managing your prejudices. You know, as I said earlier, you know, um, there, say the groups of people with the like multiple tattoos and the purple hair and that sort of thing, I do, that's, that's a prejudice that I have to ma manage, even when it doesn't go away, even when I still have a feeling of, oh, I'm uncomfortable with that person. When I see somebody like that ahead in front of me and I'm interacting with them, I actually turn the volume up. Oh, yes, that's my prejudice. That's my prejudice making me feel, have that yuck feeling. It doesn't have anything to do with the individual standing in front of me. I don't know anything about the individual standing in front of me. The reason I have that yuck feeling is me. It's me generating that yuck feeling. It's not them.